learn from that section. Any questions? Because I'm going to give you the quiz today. I'll take it. But I want you to turn it in. So anyway, take a look at these packs there. Uh, turn it on Friday. We do have a separate bank, of course. We tried to run it a couple times, and we haven't had enough extra space. So, uh, we haven't had all the time. So, turn it in on Friday at 9 o'clock. That was, of course, the week. So, last day of class. Friday is our last day of class. All the finals on Monday. Uh, today, we have a, we have a, a guest speaker. Yes, presenter, uh, Ben Height, who is getting ready to finish up his parallel department, and uh, he's going to do a presentation about investigations, and which is chapter eight, essentially. And then on Friday, we will finish up talking about interviewing. And if we have any time, we'll talk about chapter nine, which is the terminology about computers. You probably know that already, so I'm not going to spend really any time on that. Just Any questions on anything that we're doing? Do they have more questions? Right. Right, it's like that. Okay, we're going to finish today. We'll have, we may have a few minutes left over. If you have questions, you can ask questions. If not, we'll continue talking a little bit about interviewing. So we'll Is this going to be on the test? Yeah, please. Now maybe even a little bit. All right, guys. Um, we're going to talk this morning about investigations. Um, by now, most of y'all have already learned how to interview clients, and the whole point behind investigations is to get as much information as you can. Now, you know how to interview the clients already, so we're going to take all of what you've learned and we're going to take it to the next level. Already? Already. <laughs> okay, we're going to use a fact scenario today. We're going to be taking a look at the steps involved in the investigation of an auto accident. Um, who's to blame is not relevant because it's going to be pretty much the same process no matter what you do. It doesn't matter if it's you're the guy that you're representing the guy that hit the woman or the woman that got hit by the guy. It's going to be the same process uh, regardless. Now, the first thing that you're going to want to sit there and do is you're going to want to create an investigation plan. Okay, and all an investigation plan is just basically like it up there, step by step list of tasks that you're going to sit there and do, gather the information, get factual information. You want to get people's opinions, you know, you want to formulate all this and throw it into a plan for your attorney. Now, one of the most important things whenever you are building a investigative plan is to make sure your supervising attorney approves it because this is what you don't want to have happen. You don't want your attorney looking like this. I'm, I'm going to pass out a couple copies of an investigative plan. This was actually for a federal criminal trial, but the, the pretty much the process that you'll see in there. Is, is the same. You can use it as a guide. If anybody wants to copy that afterwards, let me know. We'll have to find that. We can try that. Okay. Wait, is this going to be a copy? Okay. Now we're going to. The first thing that we're going to do, especially in the auto injury case or auto accident case, is going to be contact the police department. Um, that's one of the very first things that you should do because you want to see a copy of the police report. Now, most cities, it's usually pretty easy to get a hold of the police report. But it's a little fickle about it at times, but generally you go down there. I don't remember what the fee is. It's like, I think it used to be the first copy was free or something like that, but I think it's now like five, two, five or ten dollars for the for a copy. Guess what? Your attorney gets to go that to the client. But you want to have a copy of the accident report. That's going to tell you a lot of what you need to know from the police perspective. 
Now, remember, too, a lot of accidents now, the police won't even go to the scene. If it's just a minor fender bender, forget it. Top 20 will show up, they'll break you online now, and love it, at least. And you'll fill out your information online. But either way, you still need to get a hold of that report, no matter what. It's going to tell you, it's going to give you all the facts on the police. Who, what, when, where, why, how. It's going to tell you the names of any witnesses, basic information that you may or may not mesh up with everyone else, but it gives you the facts as the police have. Okay, well, the next steps you're going to take is uh, contacting and interviewing witnesses. This is probably the most, one of the most important steps because witnesses can either make or break the case. Um, witnesses are going to sit there and be able to tell you what happened, when it happened, they're going to give you their perspective. But remember, for every good witness you have, they're going to have one that's going to contradict everything the other person said. So, like, not all. You may have. Uh, witness on your side, you may have a 10 year old little girl who saw it. Well, think about the way a 10 year old thinks. They may have a 45 year old man that saw what he saw. Think about how he thinks. A 10 year old may blow things out of proportion, may exaggerate. You got to keep that in mind when you're interviewing your witnesses. You got to keep in mind their age, background, if they're wearing glasses, if they have hearing aids, if they are blind. You got to take all these various things into consideration when you're interviewing your witnesses. If the witness has retained an attorney, guess what? You can't talk to them. You have to go through their attorney. And most of the time, a witness probably won't bore you with unless there's just something really strange going on, or at least I think that, that's generally the case. I remember we talked about that a long time ago, that generally witnesses are not going to unless it was a really large case, multi-vehicle pile up, something like that. So if they do have an attorney, they told you they're being represented, you can't talk to them if you have to go through. So what happens in a big accident situation where maybe a driver in another vehicle is your client accident, but then they're also a party to the other part of the thing. You have to return to each other. You know, the other driver might have seen your, your client part of your client part of the thing. They could be another car and stuff. They could be all the same part of the thing. Now, the next part is where things start getting kind of oh, sticky. Apparently, we're missing a complete slide here, so no big deal. We'll just keep on going. And that's going to be obtaining medical and employment records. Most important thing, especially when you're dealing with medical records with HIPAA and every other thing that's going on with privacy now, you need to make sure that you have releases. You need to have releases because a lot of hospitals, a lot of doctors' offices, clinics, they're not things to tell you anything about that. So those releases are very, very important. And the same thing goes also with employment records. A lot of companies, <clears throat> especially larger companies, outsource their HR. They're not going to talk to you without a release. And sometimes even with a release, they may not talk to you. They may not be willing to give you information. You've got to use initiative to get the information. But do it legally. Use legal initiative. Don't don't try to get don't get scammy. Don't don't try to play paralogue. Tell people all kinds of stuff. Tell them the truth, give them the forms that they don't want to give to you. There are, there's other ways to gain the information that you have. But always make sure that you're doing everything like that on the other. Now this is one that I think is really important too, especially when you're dealing with auto accidents. Contact the National Weather Service. Why? Very good. Because what if it was, you know, one party says, no, it was cloudy and it was misty and somebody else says, no, it wasn't, it's coming a full day on floor. No, it wasn't. It was partly sunny. You know, this is West Texas. The weather changes with the snap of the thing. So it's very important to contact the National Weather Service. So that way you can determine what the weather predictions were at the time of the accident. Because if one person says, oh, it was just misty, and somebody else says it was a downpour, who are you going to believe? Because water on the road makes some serious conditions. Extremely sunny days, especially if you've driven on some of the streets around here, you get a reflection back. You want to know all this. This puts you one step ahead. Uh, the National Weather Service usually keeps this stuff on their website. A lot of times you don't even have a problem. You can go to their website and they'll give you up to, I want to say it's 45 day previous history of what the weather's been like. So, and it's pretty hard to, pretty hard to contradict the National Weather Service. Okay, obtaining the vehicle title and registration records. This is extremely important. Why, why would you think that's important? You're looking at any questions, so you've got questions or you're confused. So why, why do you think that would be? Yeah. 
That's right. And think about what kind of town. We are in a college town. Okay. Little Johnny, exactly. Little Johnny Jr. is driving mommy and daddy's car. Little Johnny Jr.'s insurance expired. Who owns the car? Who becomes the responsible party? Johnny Sr. So you want to know exactly who the cars belong to. You want to know are they currently registered. Because you can use these things. You've got to say, your attorney can use these things. Especially if, let's say, the registration on the vehicle is out. Why were they on the road to begin with? Same thing with inspection certificates. You want to make sure the inspection on the vehicle is correct. And make sure that it is legitimate. Because one of the biggest problems that they're having right now in the state is 40% of inspection standards on cars right now are hot. They were either hot or they were paying them false premiums. And just a little side note, the legislation will be bringing that up again to eliminate the vehicle inspection part of it. They've tried this several times. It's all got shot down. But when you think about 40% of inspection stickers are, no, are technically no good, what's that telling you? We're no safer now. You know, we're no, we're no safer with or without. But it's very important to do this. But also, I would call, make sure you call the tax assessor's office in Lubbock County and other cities. They do it differently. Like in Dallas, you actually go to what used to be the Texas Department of Transportation, which is now the Department of Motor Vehicles, and find out what they need to get this information because they may need releases. They may have different things that they need. DMV will sometimes want something different than what like the tax assessor's office here in Lubbock County does not. Just make sure that you can gain that information. If you need to pay a fee, if you need to have releases, VIN numbers, they'll tell you everything you need. Generally, you're going to need a minimum license plate number and the VIN number of the vehicle. The VIN number is the 17 digit number. You usually find it either on the door or it'll be up in the windshield. Well, Insurance company, by the way, is not your friend. It's not your client's friend, it's not the other party's friend. The insurance company is there for one sole purpose, and that's to make the money. They don't like to pay it out. If they did, they wouldn't be coming to see your supervising attorney. Insurance companies are not fun. But what you want to know, first of all, you, you want to get a, try to get a copy of the policy from your client if they have it available. If they don't, have them call their insurance company, you call their insurance company, get their policy. You need theirs. You also are going to need the other person in the accident policy. They may not be willing to give it up voluntarily. It never hurts to act. If you can eliminate a step, why not? Yes, ma'am. But what, I, what I, I think I'm taking a step further is you want the actual policy. You want to see their policy. You want to see the policy. You want to see the coverage. You want to see the limits. You want, you want to see all of these various things. And like I said, a lot of times it's easier just to get it. They have it lawyered up, call an accident. If not, all their attorney asks them, hey, do you have a copy of the policy? They might very well give it up, but they may not. If they don't, be ready to contact the insurance company and, and get ready for a little bit of a fight because they will do everything they can to not deal with you, talk to you, they'll put you in the endless. Not always. Not always, but I, I from personal experience, State Farm, yeah, not fun. Yeah, State Farm is fun. Yeah, <laughs> State Farm is not fun, but be prepared to. to Try to be as nice as possible, but you may have to get aggressive. So if you don't have an aggressive bone in your body, better better go rent one, find one, borrow one, you know, lease one, find one on eBay because there are going to come. We will have to get aggressive with the insurance company. Uh, the reason that you want their insurance information also is because if the other party decides to file some sort of claim against theirs as well. Uh, for example, if, if, if they sit there and there's a dispute and the cops don't say, say it's a no fault accident, which somebody's got to be at fault, they may try to put a claim against that person's insurance. You want to know what your party's coverage limits are. And also, because if, you're, if there's a chance the other party may try to counter sue you, they may try to sue you for much more than what the policy covers. So you want to basically, I, I, call, it, I call it CYA. <laughs> And, and 
that's one thing too that we're still having a major problem in Texas with people that are either uninsured or underinsured, even though there are programs now in place for the most made the state of Texas where you get pulled over. I know uh, the LPD does not do it currently, but in the sheriff's office, they will call your insurance company. They will verify coverage. They don't care that you can't get a card that says, hey, your insurance is good. They don't care. They call every single time these have a former what was Mike? A sheriff's deputy exactly? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I've asked him about that stuff management a couple years ago. They don't care if you've got a card. I can print out insurance cards all day long in the lab. Ten dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, in a lot of the major cities like Dallas and Houston and Austin, they will they can actually in their little in car computer they can look it up. Now the LPD um, has applied for grants to do this, but. You know, as of now, they don't do it. They just look at the card. If they make something suspicious, you don't call it in. But for the most part, they don't check. But I also remind you, too, if you don't have insurance in the state, of, or at least in Hawaii County, or maybe, so you're trying to. My experience has been in contact with insurance companies for the other drivers that they don't have to half the time the other driver has not reported an accident. That's right. I've heard of it. It's only been an accident. Yeah, two weeks ago, they reported it. And the reason they don't do that is because they're scared that the rates are going to go up and they're going to be dropped. Well, that's probably going to happen no matter what. Even with these policies now to have the accident forgiveness and all this. Yeah, right. They'll forgive it. It's going to, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you a pretty, pretty little penny. Now, this is something that some firms use, and the reason, and this should become real apparent to me in a moment, using professional investigative services, hiring a PI. Why would you hire a PI? What if uh, the person that hit you, or the person you hit, doesn't matter which way you want to look at it, got the cast on, got the big neck brace on, they'll sit there and watch us. Next thing you know, you see them in the backyard playing uh, soccer with kids. Really? You can do that with a neck brace and a, and a cast and all this other stuff? Because there are fly-by-night doctors all the time that will that flat out lie. People are, are good. You have people that get into accidents as a If you've ever watched Dateline, Dateline does this at least once or twice a year. But they'll sit there and show people that have calling the insurance system. Exactly. It's not hard to do. If you know what to go into the ER and tell them, most of the time, they won't even they won't even actually check. They'll just write the prescription, say, "Yeah, this is what's wrong with you." And then three weeks, three days later, they're out the back there playing with the kids, or they're on the roof painting the house. Um, there was uh, one on Dateline about three or four months ago. A guy was uh, hit by an 18 wheeler. He said he was all kinds of injured. You know, he had neck brace, knee brace, all kinds of funky slings on him. Private investigator went out to video him painting his house. Now you tell me how a guy in a neck brace is going to paint his house. He's How's the guy to how's the guy to harm something in a paint house? He's not. A lot of times you want to do that simply to protect you. I mean, you'll sit there and hire a uh, private investor and stuff to protect your client, or if you happen to be working for an insurance attorney that's working for an insurance company, you have to protect the insurance company. That's it. Because what do we call that? And the insurance fraud is very, very prevalent. Always has been, always will be, but guess what? People get the fraud. Uh, the other reason also is sometimes you may you may have a difficult time tracking somebody day. You may be involved in a hit run. You may have a partial license plate number. Good luck getting the police to help. I've been involved in two hit runs. People took off. Never heard of, never heard anything back. The cops don't care. And sometimes you have to have a PI to, to help track those people down. They can do it. They've got the time to get the the money. Okay, telephone and city directories. Now, this one, I, I pulled this out of the textbook, and I'm kind of embarrassed to even bring this one up, because who, who was last time have y'all used the telephone? <laughs> okay, you're the weirdo that doesn't have a computer, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the telephone book, even though it's, it's very antiquated and not many people use it, you'd be amazed at how many people are still listed. You know, you'd be amazed at how many uh, Grandpa and Grandma Smiths still have a landline telephone that are still listening. They don't list cell phones in the telephone. But you'd be amazed at how many people are still have. 
Now, the city directories, once uh, y'all get into legal research, uh, you'll go to the, the county law library, and they have what's called a city directory. Uh, they don't, I don't believe they do them anymore. They were done for years and years and years. They used to send people out almost like census workers, and they would have your address, your name, who lives there, what their occupation was, what their phone number was. They could call this not only from door to door, but they would come to public records. Great big book, probably about this thick, about this tall, businesses, individuals. Um, I know that the County Law Library only has them up until about 2004, 2005. But even if you've got one that's four, five, six years old, it still could be a valuable source of information if you're trying to locate a witness, if you're trying to locate, you know, somebody who might have any information if you have no other leads. Sometimes these two resources could be a great benefit, even though they are kind of old now. Um, the next one, we're gonna we're gonna move into the twentieth to the twenty first century now. It's going to be it's going to be online people finders. With the advent of the internet, you knew privacy was going away, right? You knew you were gonna be able to be found any place, anytime, anywhere. Thanks to great sites like Google and Facebook, it's almost impossible to be anonymous. Now, online people finders are absolutely incredible. It's a great way to find people that have, have literally tried to fall off the radar by conventional means, by not being in the telephone book, having prepaid cell phones, so on and so forth. Um, there's a great one called a uh, U.S. Search. U.S. Search comes about 350 different resources. They purchase uh, dossiers on people all the time. They uh, have to deal with experience that they buy certain what could be construed as public information from them. Um, I have actually located uh, people that I needed to find for other reasons on there, and usually within minutes, I have their name, which I better know their name, any alias they've used, current address, addresses for the last 10 years, last known phone number. Now, that's still the hard part is finding a phone number, because you know, with, with cell phones not being listed, that can be difficult. But sometimes all you need is just an address, because it's amazing what a certain amount of letters will do. Services uh, can also help you use to locate the witness's assets. If you've got a judgment against, or not necessarily a witness, but a, either a defendant or client, whoever, the opposite party who you're trying to get something out of, they may have properties somewhere else. Hey, you know, we didn't know about that. You live in this two bedroom check. We didn't know about the beach house in Redondo Beach, California. It's worth $2.3 million. We didn't know about that, but we do now. It's a great way to, to, to start that first step, especially if you have to locate assets, if you do have to have a judgment against someone. Um, most searches on there run about anywhere from three to ten dollars, depending on the level of information. Once again, if you can't find anybody in any other way, get your attorney's permission. They'll build it, they'll build fine. <laughs> but it comes in very, very handy. They cover, I know US search covers about 90% of people in the US. They advertise that very heavily. But there are other uh, sites also, peoplefinder.com. There's also a lot of free resources. You can go to whitepages.com, that's free. And sometimes just Google their name. You'd be amazed to put, put, uh, you put their name in the city and state. You'd be amazed to put them up there. Just hope it's not John Smith or Peter Jones. Common names, good luck to you. If you have a less than common name, you'd be amazed to what you can find out. Google yourself sometimes. See what you it would, it would probably it would probably scare you. There's another site called Zebo, Z E B O dot com, that is also it's kind of an ad based people finder. They have a bunch of advertising on their website, but you can find a lot of people that way. I would always try to go the free route first, unless your client has big bucks. Client has big bucks, and your supervising attorney said, "Let's get some hours, let's charge some fees, do it." But always try to go the free route first. Always make your paid resources your last. Okay, other information sources that we have. Newspapers, magazines, televisions, and videos. How often have y'all turned on the KMAC 28 news and sex? There's been a three-part highlight at 82nd and Quaker. Again. And you'd be amazed at how often a lot of the TV stations catch accidents on camera as they happen. So it may be you want to get in good with uh, a news producer. Or an assignment editor of one of the local TV or radio stations. We, um, about, I guess it was during the, the flooding we had earlier this year, Channel 11 was at the intersection of 98 and Milwaukee talking about the flooding out there. 
accident happened right behind you. You know how valuable that could be to prove the case? Very valuable. Guess how much it cost? A couple of phone calls, maybe taking assignments at them out for lunch one day. Get to know the media. Especially if you're going to work in these kind of cases, get to know the media. Get to know your newspaper report. Get to know your radio report. Get to know your TV report. Invite them to lunch. Take them out for a drink one night after work. Get to know them because they can prove to be a very valuable asset. Now, you know, when you see a video of something on TV, that's not all the video. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is public sometimes. Sometimes you may have to fill out a uh, freedom of information request, a uh, access to funding. What's the other one taken to Texas? Um, open records. You may have to file for open records. The odds of, of having to access some of these government records are probably going to be slim, but it's good to know this in the event because what if, for example, you have a employee of a government agency that gets it? Got in the mail truck just gets it. Have you ever tried to get information from the post office or any government agency? It's not going to be fun. It's going to be a little bit rougher than you think, so you've got to be prepared to accept. It never hurts to ask. Always ask. Somebody, you know, old saying loose lips sink ships. Well, a lot of people in the world have very loose lips. But be prepared once again to get aggressive, especially if you have to deal with the government agency because they're going to be less likely to work with you, more likely to want a piece of paper with signatures and 15 forms of triple good. Just be prepared for those types of things. But the Freedom of Information Act is what you're going to use when you deal with the federal government. The Texas Open Records Act is what you're going to use when you're dealing with the state of Texas. Like I said, really, unless you're dealing with somebody who's a public official, somebody who works for a state or government agency, you probably won't ever deal with that. Okay, direct versus circumstantial evidence. Now we're going to talk about investigation of the rules of evidence. I'm not going to go too deep into this because if you don't take evidence, you will learn a whole lot of this stuff right here. Uh, direct evidence is any evidence that it will be establishes the truth of the fact that it the circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence that even if believed does not establish the fact. But what it does is, it, is it, it kind of describes the likelihood of the fact, but it's not it's not solid. Um, relevant evidence. Relevant evidence is evidence that tends to prove or disprove the fact in question. Obviously, for example, if you've got the video from Channel 11 that shows the accident, shows the, that the other party ran right to that stop sign and fired into your clients, guess what that is? That's relevant evidence. Because it absolutely proves what happened. Whereas if it was the other way around and they said, no, I didn't run that stop sign, and it was proven otherwise, it would just, so it, it's proof that's, that's there that can, that can either prove or disprove. It's solid. I would say, I would call it soft evidence. Okay, authentication of evidence. Now, y'all are going to love this whenever y'all get that into your evidence. It's the process of authenticating the genuineness of, of an item that's to be presented to evidence in the trial. Okay, sometimes it's something as simple as asking somebody, can you identify this? Yes, I can. What is it? It can be something as simple as, is this your signature on a piece of paper? Yes, it is. You just authenticate. Is this the title to your 1986 Ford Escort? Yes, it is. You just authenticate. There's many ways to authenticate, but I'm not going to go into all of those. You know, those have been now, here's the fun part. Hearsay. And hearsay, this, this is why it's very important to pay attention when you are interviewing uh, clients, witnesses, and other parties. Because hearsay can get you into more trouble than what it's worth. You can wind up having something you think is great, but there's 26 exceptions to the hearsay rule. Once again, you learn about this. You don't need to know to trust it, because I still don't even know that. How many of you can you name, Mr. Blank? Can you name all 26 of them? See? <laughs> but there's 26 exceptions. But for the most part, hearsay is testimony that is given in court by a witness who relates not what he or she knows personally, but what another person said. Uh, hearsay is generally not admissible as evidence. Generally. Like I said, there are 26 exceptions to that. Basically, you can't sit there right now and tell a court and say, well, Donna Joe Carnes told me that Larry was talking about blah, 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 blah. That's hearsay. Unless you were there with them. You were there talking to Larry and Donna Joe. You would be a part of that conversation. But because Donna Joe just tells you something that Larry said, that's hearsay. Oh. That's double hearsay, and, and you'll, your head's will spin when you learn about hearsay, double hearsay, and, and there can be three. So it'll drive you to break. That's why well, that's legal writing. Well, that, yeah, legal writing, too. Uh, now, the policy underlying the hearsay, well, hearsay evidence is inadmissible not because it's unreliable, it's not because it's unreliable, it's not because it's irrelevant. 
Sometimes it can be it can be very much relevant, but it's inadmissible because there's no way to authenticate what it's saying. It's basically your word versus someone else and what somebody else said this. Okay, true. Because I can sit there and say that you told me before class, I'm going to cheat on this test. I'm going to make it on this test. Well, if I go to Mr. Pine and say, Mr. Pine, that's Mr. Pine. That's Mr. Now, if I've got that video camera on, I'm going to say, that's all the story. But, yeah, y'all are going to love it. Y'all are absolutely going to love it. Um, expect, exceptions are made in specific circumstances, often because the statements are made in situations that indicate high degree of reliability. Um, once again, that, that's going to fall under some of your 26 exceptions. Cited utterance, for example. For example, if a uh, you know, guy hits a car, one of the witnesses is here, you know, oh my God, that guy just hit that car. That's excited utterance. That's okay. If they say something in the heat of the moment like that, that's okay. That's more than 26 exceptions. I'm not going to give you other things. I'll give you something to do over there. Okay. Now we're going to talk about summarizing your results. Um, you want to have an overall summary. And if you look through that, that paper, you could have seen kind of a, there should have been a summary in there that kind of explains to you how you want to summarize. You want to thoroughly describe for the reader all the facts that you've gathered about the case. And remember, you're writing this to your supervising attorney. So, you know, as much as you think, well, I can use all these fancy boy boy things, it turns down. Plain English, <coughs> short, sweet, to the point. Don't exactly, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't take something you can describe in one sentence and turn it to a paragraph. Short, sweet, to the point. Stay what you need to stay. Um, it needs to be written in such a way that someone not familiar with the case could read it and become adequately informed of the case's factual background. So even though you're writing this for your attorney, what if all of a sudden your attorney has to go to the hospital or dies or is disbarred or whatever reason and it has to go to another attorney. You want that attorney to be able to pick that up, read it, and understand exactly what happened in that situation. Well, for that matter, maybe it's getting crazy to another parent. Maybe your firm has just been terminated and your files your files going somewhere else. You want to make sure that the next person that picks up that summary understands exactly what happened. Keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it to point. Um, one thing you learn when you do leave the writing Seriously, I mean, he, he's drilled this into our heads. Don't use needless words. Don't sit there and use a bunch of, of legalese, even though you are talking to an attorney or someone with a mic. Keep it sweet. Keep it plain evil. Think about how you would want to read it. If you were reading it in a magazine, think of it that way. If you were reading an article in the paper about that, thing. Think, think of those things when you write this out. Of course, do it what your supervisor your attorney wants. If he wants 55 pages, then you can summarize the opinion. Give him those 55 pages. That's more time he's able to build Source by source summaries. This is very, very important. Just like you have to sit there and put sources in any of the papers, right? You have to put sources in any academic papers. It's no different with this. You need to create a list of information sources. And that's your witnesses. That's going to be any evidence you found. You have to pull title first. You have to test, you have to get to policy. You need to cite them. You need to have a list showing what you have, where it's at. That way, they can go back and refer to it. Because otherwise, you're just making stuff up out of thin air. And I guess you could almost call that legal plagiarism when you don't have this stuff. Because we don't, we can't prove where you got it. Better to have too much, in my opinion, too much source information is defined may make you differently. But I think I would rather have too much than not enough. This is one of the few times that when it comes to this type of information, you probably want to have more, too much than not enough. Especially if, if you think your clients may be in, in trouble. You may want to have a lot of extra material to cover. Once you get see why, I don't know if that's answered. You better believe it. But we want to make sure also that whenever you're doing your, your source summaries, be sure to, to you know, use proper blue book citations if you're citing cases. Be sure to give enough description so not just insurance policy, but okay, insurance policy, great, who's insurance policy? You might want to sit there and say, uh, Donna Jones, State Farm Insurance Policy, dated September 1st, 2010. You want, you want to give just enough information so that way, you know, they're not wondering well, who's insurance policy. When's it, when's it good for? So just be sure to, that's one thing you want to be super specific. 
Okay, here are conclusions and recommendations. Okay, in the final section of your of your uh, investigation report, it's been a long time. You uh, should present no overall conclusion about the investigation, as well as any suggestions that will help you develop the case. Your attorneys are going to ask periodically for your thoughts and your opinion. It doesn't mean they're going to do what you suggest. But they're going to take that into consideration because guess who's been doing all the labor? After you've done a few thousand, a few hundred of these cases, you go work for a personal injury attorney. Heck, they may do what you want from what you say every time because you've been out there doing it. But keep in mind that just because you make a recommendation to the supervisor, does not mean they have to follow it. And they may not. They may, they may do a complete 180 because of what they want to do versus what you think they just remember that. Don't get don't get your feelings hurt or anything. If, if they sit there and decide to go a different direction, okay, no big deal. And you know, if you are curious as to why they change my ask. Never heard to ask, well, okay, well, yeah, but we'll just do it with a professional man. You know, why is it that you you decided to go this way? If nothing else, it helps give you a better understanding of what your attorney is thinking, their thought process. That way, so in the future when we have these types of cases come up. You can kind of already be thinking like they're thinking. Because if the two of y'all are in the sink, you're probably going to get a lot better. Uh, and you might also suggest what further information can be obtained during discovery because in these kind of cases, most of them settle. I think the last statistic I read is like 96% of personal injury cases get settled and they don't make it to But guess what? There's 1% chance that it will. So you may have to go through discovery, and if you think there's other things you need, Let's say you hit a roadblock with some information, you may have to have it discovered. So be sure to sit down and, and talk with your attorney and let them know, hey, look, I think we're going to be document A, document B, document C. We're going to be uh, this item A, item B, item C. The only way we're going to be able to get through discovery. That way he has a heads up, they can obtain this information. And who knows, after they obtain it, you may set it. You may not even make it all the way to court. And that's pretty much it. Uh, if anybody have any questions? I know that was a lot of information in a really short period. Look at the rate place. All right. Anybody been involved in doing this presentation? Question I have for you: Why is it why is it beneficial to family members? How does that? Help? They know where they are, and they don't want to be bugged. Your family members don't want to be bugged with your crap. <laughs> That's why I like these collection agencies are so successful because they also don't bug your friends and family and neighbors. So you you want to see that if you pet if you pester people not pester people it's psychological that you pester them not they'll break their information and say you know they'll tell them look at that don't get mad at the family member and say call this person back I'm tired of dealing with them or else blah 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 and then they'll do that so yeah that's bugging bugging friends family and neighbors sometimes is, I mean I know people wouldn't want that done to them but at the same time you need the information. Give them back to him. So. Oh, normally, I tell y'all have a great day. I'll tell y'all have a great day. We'll finish up talking about Adrian on Friday. We're going to have a total school litigation meeting this class for today. We'll get the call back tomorrow. Then I'm going to go down to the place. Whatever you want to get through here. Hopefully, we'll see it. Well, oh. we have prizes too. And green bean casserole with bacon. I got it. I got it. You like bacon, beat your mom.